There we go. All right. Uh, our next guest is uh, actually came uh, as a replacement, but I'm very happy to have him. It's a uh, uh, very knowledgeable in this area, very passionate, and I think that's what's uh, really important. Uh, we were supposed to have Michael McCrubery here, he was on the 60 Minutes program, but I'm not sure a lot of times there's a lot of politics and who gets in those programs, but uh, uh, he couldn't make it, and he recommended very graciously someone who uh, is very knowledgeable in the subject, and uh, we'll be talking today. One of the things uh, I'm really hoping this happens, I, it is happening, like Stoyan Sarge, who just today was talking, has some models of why he thinks cold fusion will work at room temperature from his uh, models of the atomic and subatomic structures. So there's a lot of things here, there's a lot of dynamics, I think a lot of uh, uh, interaction that can go on, but uh, uh, we're not gonna take too much time, but. Uh, and introducing because we want to keep moving, but we, we have Frank Gordon from the Global Energy Corporation, and we're very pleased to have him. So, welcome him. He's going to be talking about how hot is cold fusion. Welcome. Thank you. I, I think this is probably the first time I've given a, a presentation on cold fusion where this may be the least controversial. Yeah. Subject. <laughs> who was originally supposed to be here is, is a good friend. Uh, uh, he I double booked and, and there's a law of physics that I, I haven't heard challenged yet and that is you can't be in two places at the same time. So, oh, oh okay. There's quantum physics. Yeah, in any event. Um, so I, I'm, ha I'm happy to be here. Mike was on 60 Minutes. I still worked for the Navy at the time and I and, uh, was the head of the Research and Applied Sciences Department at the Navy Lab in San Diego, and we've been doing uh, cold fusion research since 1989. In fact, a couple of the people that worked for me had actually published papers with uh, Dr. Fleischman, Martin Fleischman, so they knew him, knew what he had been doing, and actually knew it well in advance, and so we started to do experiments right away and, and uh, have a 21-year history of that. I retired last year so I could spend full time working on cold fusion. Uh, 60 Minutes asked for a permission for an on-camera interview and the Navy public affairs officer uh, said no. Yeah, the, <laughs> when you had 60 Minutes and the Navy haven't always gotten along. And so, so anyhow, not knowing a little more about the story, they said no. Now, as it turns out, uh, and I'll show you a video here, uh, the CBS Discovery Science Channel uh, program Brink had actually done a video on us and some of the work that we had done uh, a couple of months before the 60 minute article ran. So with that, uh, let me go, go to the next slide. Okay, here we are, 1989, and, and uh, you know, this March 23rd, you know, they always say if you're gonna screw up, don't do it on a slow news day. <laughs> and I don't know if March 23rd was a slow news day, but when you make an announcement as momentous as this, it generates a lot of interest. And, and of course, the physics community uh, had kind of a, a schizophrenic reaction. They, they claimed it can't be, but at the same time, hundreds, if not thousands of them, went into the lab to try and replicate the results. Uh, on, on the 24th of March, 1989, was when the Exxon Valdez ran aground and started what, until two months ago, had been the, the world's largest oil spill disaster. Um, and so if, if, if the Announcement alone didn't stimulate the interest, certainly uh, that event, and of course Chernobyl had only been three years prior to this announcement, so, so this, this was primed to be uh, stir a lot of interest. Uh, the physics community noted that uh, the experiments weren't repeatable, that uh, they, there weren't any referee papers, that experiments hadn't been replicated. If it's nuclear, where, where, you know, where is the nuclear ash? In fact, uh, a comment that still exists to this day is, if it was nuclear, you'd be generating neutrons, and you'd all be dead. You're not dead, therefore it must not be nuclear. <laughs> uh, in fact, that was a reviewer's comment on a paper that we submitted just about six months ago. Um, in spite of all this, thousands of scientists went in the lab and tried to replicate the results. And, and uh, you know, the dreams of a world where energy wasn't going to be a controlling factor, where it would be unlimited, where it would be free, uh, where it couldn't be used for war, uh, you know, or as a reason for war, 
uh, drove all these people into the lab to see what, what else was there. Okay. Another uh, reason for the controversy, and I'm sure most of the people here already know this, but it's, it's probably worth pointing out again, and that is that chemical reactions produce it on the order of, let's say, five electron volts per atom, whereas nuclear reactions produce millions of electron volts per atom. So, you know, here, not only uh, are we going to use a lot less fuel, uh, we're going to get a lot more energy out. And I'll remind everyone again here, you don't need to be reminded that combustion is, in fact, a chemical reaction. So, uh, this in itself was a reason for the physics community to, to get excited. And, and uh, the other thing was, it just plain wasn't consistent with theory. Now, that's uh, something that everyone here understands. Um, I mentioned a lot of people went to the lab to try and replicate the results, and, and most of them failed. There were a few who claimed that they had repeated the results. Uh, uh, most, a lot of times, then they, they later had to withdraw their claims. Uh, a lot of reasons for that. One reason was uh, this was what Pons and Fleischmann had done. They took a palladium rod, they submerged it in, in deuterated water, D2O, and they electrolyzed against it. The thing they didn't put in their press announcement was that typically it takes about two weeks for the, for the deuterium to load up before you were going to start to see any sort of reaction if you see anything at all. And so people didn't realize that. You had uh, physicists and, and non-electrochemists, for example, going and trying to do these experiments. Uh, another thing, sometimes they had the palladium rod coming up above the, the, the surface of the deuterium, and so the deuterium would, would go in here uh, and just diffuse out up above. Uh, there were lots of reasons, you know, they, they went in the lab, dug out whatever palladium they had on hand, uh, whatever deuterated water they had on hand, and nobody knew the, the pedigree of either. So, so anyhow, there were lots of reasons why this system didn't work. For our part, uh, I had some electrochemists who were, at the time, were working on uh, high energy density batteries for torpedo propulsion, and as I mentioned, they knew Pons and Flashman knew what they had done. And they said, let's do it differently. So whereas everyone else tried to repeat the Pons Flashman experiment and the Pons Flashman protocol, we never did. We started with initially just a piece of copper uh, in a palladium chloride solution, so palladium chloride, lithium chloride, and deuterated water. Uh, the, the cathode or the uh, cathode, the anode, you apply a current, and what happens is the palladium plates out onto the surface of the cathode. You know, this is just typical electroplating. That happens to be the same surface where the deuterium evolves. So as it's plating out, the deuterium is loading into the lattice at the same time. And, and this has a lot of advantages for us. Um, this is, is what we would see if you took a look at the surface area. You see this kind of cauliflower image and, and uh, a lot of you know, the, the structure of the surface when, when we did it this way. And, and we were seeing events occur very quickly. We didn't have to wait two weeks. Okay, next. Uh, we published our results in, and uh, I've got a data later, about 25 peer-reviewed papers. And, and where I have in red here, some of the first things we published on the, on the co-deposition in general electrolyte chemistry, uh, three of them here. Uh, extremely high repeatability, Pons and Fleischmann's experiments worked maybe one out of ten times. Ours worked virtually 100%. I think the only time we did not have a, a successful cell was when we were trying to stretch it and see how fast could we make it happen and how, you know, what were the margins of, of when it would work. Uh, this this co-deposition process also provides us with a lot of experimental flexibility. And I'll, as I go through the presentation, I'll touch on the way we've taken advantage of that a few times. Uh, multiple cell configurations are possible. An extremely high surface area. You know, they say if you're ready to be good uh, or lucky, uh, choose being lucky. Well, in this case, I think we were both good and lucky. Uh, we were good. I had some very world-class electrochemists who, who thought of this co-deposition approach. We were lucky in that it happened to generate a lot of surface area, which we now understand to be important in the loading and also important in the production of, of the events that we're seeing. 
And also the defects were built into the lattice. This was another thing.